The theoretically most sacred texts in Brahmanic and later Hindu religion were the Vedas, the collection of orally transmitted works dating back to the migration, conquest and settlement of the Indo-Aryan people following the collapse of the Indus Valley Civilization. These texts, called Shruti, literally that which is heard, were taken as revealed truth that had been preserved syllable by syllable from the past, resulting in the Vedas that we hear and read today being preserved in an archaic form of Sanskrit, called Vedic Sanskrit. However, these Shruti texts, which include the philosophical Upanishads, never had the same popular appeal that would come from the later epic, religious, and philosophical works, called Smriti, or that which is remembered. The two greatest works in the epic vein of Smriti were the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. The Ramayana preserves the exploits of the warrior king Rama, the avatar of the god Vishnu, who is the preserver component of the Hindu trinity, with Brahman as the creator and Shiva as the destroyer. The word avatar, literally meaning descent, refers to the earthly incarnation of gods and goddesses who are born into the world to fulfil some divine purpose. The Mahabharata also involves another avatar of Vishnu, called Krishna, who plays an ancillary role to a broader conflict between two royal clans of cousins, the Kaurava and the Pandava, who are fighting for control of the kingdom of the Hastinapura. After a series of treacheries, conflicts and divine interventions, the two groups of cousins are prepared to join battle at Kurukshetra in northern, northern modern India. However, it is at this point of the epic that one of the jewels of Indian philosophical thought crystallizes, the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita, literally translated as the Song of God, is a small subsection of the Mahabharata which describes a conversation between Arjuna, one of the Pandava princes, and his charioteer, Krishna, the avatar of Vishnu. Arjuna requests Krishna to drive the chariot out between the two armies which have drawn up in formation, ready for battle. Amongst the ranks of the Kaurava, he sees friends and family from the court which he and his brothers seek to seize, and his heart falters at the thought of killing those that are dear to him. In a moment of existential crisis, he decides that he will not fight. Krishna then proceeds to convince Arjuna to pick up his bow and resume his place in the battle, and in the process discourses with Arjuna on the key topics of reality, divinity, the self, and the paths to liberation. The text acts as a systematic synthesis of earlier schools of thought, which would come to be known as Orthodox Hindu philosophy. In this process, it draws together from many themes in the Upanishads, early Vedanta, and particularly incorporates concepts from the dualistic Samkhya and Raja Yoga schools. The text reinforces the Upanishads and Vedanta schools, monistic and pantheistic understanding of reality, with the relationship between Atman, or the individual self, and Brahman, or the world soul. The individual self is fundamentally of the same stuff as the divine force which created and sustains the world. Krishna demonstrates this to Arjuna by showing himself in the form of the ultimate unlimited cosmic being, incorporating all creations, creators and destroyers, finally taking the form of a great consuming flame, with the words that would come to be recited by Oppenheimer whilst watching the first detonation of a nuclear weapon over Trinity. Now I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. However, Despite recognising a fundamentally monistic reality, the text borrows concept from dualistic Samkhya. Although all Atman are fundamentally part of the same pantheistic substrate, the individual Atman's inability to distinguish itself from Prakriti, or nature, the physical substances around us, leads to our bondage in the world and the cycle of samsara, or reincarnation. The reason for this is the tension between the three primordial qualities within Prakriti, leading to our attachment to our bodily beings through attraction and aversion, despite their temporary insignificance of the infysical compared to the infinite reality of the spiritual self. The three primordial qualities of Prakriti, or Gunas, are Sattva, or goodness, purity and harmony, Rajas, which variously means passion, action, or confusion, and Tamas, which can mean darkness, heaviness, or inertia. The three gunas combine in the minds of individuals, with the minds which are part of Prakriti as opposed to the Atman, which exists beyond Prakriti. When Sattva predominates, the mind is wise and clear, but Atman can become bound through happiness. 
When rajas predominates, the mind is active and grasping, and Atman can become bound through greed and pride. Finally, when tamas predominates, the mind becomes sluggish, stubborn, and the Atman can become bound through ignorance. Although the dualistic system of Prakriti and Purusha, as espoused in Samkhya and retold in the Bhagavad Gita, may seem at odds with the monism of Brahman, Krishna explains that all of reality is dependent on him alone, as the earthly avatar of the divine, Godhead. He explains that the world was created as an act of play by the divine, and that through Maya, variously translated as divine power or illusion, the false and changing world is maintained and detains the Atman of its inhabitants. However, Krishna not only describes the reality with which we exist and the problems which we all face, namely, from both his text point of view and the Indian thought more broadly, the problem of samsara, he also teaches the ways in which the individual can seek release from the cycle of rebirth, moksha or release. To attain moksha, Krishna details three separate paths or disciplines, called yogas. However, Krishna doesn't privilege one yoga over the others, with all three seen as legitimate means of attaining liberation from reincarnation. The first of these paths is karma yoga, or the path of action. This calls upon individuals to follow out duties expected of them due to their caste, position and relationships as expected in classical Indian society their dharma. In this sense, Krishna argues that Arjuna should join the battle and kill his kindred who oppose him for the throne because war is part and parcel of Arjuna's dharma as a member of the Kshatriya Varna, the caste of warriors and kings. Although this at first seems to be an apology for warfare and violence, Krishna goes on to admonish those who follow through on their dharma but with their mind inclined towards either attraction or aversion, which will inevitably lead to an attachment and bondage in the cycle of samsara. Instead, Krishna states that those who follow karma yoga must do so without regard to the outcomes of their actions. Only unattached action on the path of karma yoga will lead to liberation. The second option is jnana yoga, or the path of knowledge. This demands that the individual pursue a direct realization of Brahman through study and intellectual pursuit. Popular with scholars, this path allowed for and incorporated the earlier philosophical traditions dating back to the Upanishads. This also allowed those who had been decided on the path of the wandering mendicant to still be incorporated into this broader Brahmanic synthesis. However, The text has an anti-ascetic bent and appears to criticise those schools and religions, such as the Ajivaka, Jains and Buddhists, who sought to withdraw from society and attain moksha or nirvana through non-action. Although the disciple of Jnana Yoga was not following the path of Karma Yoga, they still acted, and the text highlights that even attempts at non-action are, in and of themselves, acts which continue to perpetuate the cycle of samsara. It has also been a point of scholarly and religious debate as to whether Krishna describes one path of Jnana Yoga or describes two separate paths in the form of Jnana Yoga proper and Raja Yoga of Pantajali. The final method of attaining liberation is described as Bhakti Yoga, or the path of devotion. Although Krishna describes the nobility of Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga as the dearest path to him, He also recognises the difficulty for most people in attempting to follow these paths. As such, Krishna states that anyone who devotes and surrenders themselves to him will similarly attain moksha through his grace, providing a third and more open path for those seeking to break the cycle of rebirth. This devotional path, based on prayer, meditation and worship, likely helped to incorporate the great masses of India who found neither the path of unattached action or knowledge as attractive or feasible options. However, Krishna also chastises those who selfishly follow this path, and by inference criticising the transactional sacrifice culture of earlier Brahmanism. Those who make the sacrifices in the temple for their own benefit or glory will simply become further attached to this world and continue deeper into the cycle of samsara. The Bhagavad Gita acted as a counterstroke to the efforts of the heterodox schools, binding together various traditions into a holistic path to liberation that is open to kings, priests, philosophers, and the vast masses of peasants, artisans, and merchants alike. However, 
beyond acting as a crystallization of earlier thought into a concise and defendable philosophical and theological position in response to the encroachment of Buddhism and Jainism, the text has continued to resonate across both India and the world. The text heavily influenced members of the transcendental movement of America, including Ralph Waldo Emerson. In India, the work has been used by both Gandhi in his promotion of non-violent resistance, whilst at the same time being appropriated by Hindu nationalists, including Nathuram Godse, the man who assassinated Gandhi. Regardless, the text remains a titan of spiritual and philosophical influence throughout the world, and it is key to understanding later Vedanta, which considers the Gita one of the core texts of the most influential branch of this indigenous Indian philosophy.